You're listening to a podcast by Lance Lambert Ministries. For more information on this ministry, visit lancelambert.org or follow us on social media to receive all of our updates. In this week's episode, Lance discusses the importance of faith and trust in God as he preaches from the 37th Psalm. Lance emphasizes the need to inherit the land, a picture for fully appropriating and experiencing the spiritual blessings and resources available to us in Christ. This episode was selected because of Lance's emphasis on inheriting the land, referencing the mission given to Joshua. Next week, we will be releasing a new book for Lance's Bible studies on Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, which were shared at Halford House. This book is part of the Through the Bible with Lance Lambert series, and Lance has some super helpful insights about the spiritual significance of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth in our current walks with the Lord as individuals and as a church. Joshua, Judges, and Ruth will be available on August 29th. Let's listen to what inheritance means. If you turn with me to um, the 37th Psalm. What I have um, this morning uh, is very, very simple indeed. It's just a... Really a few thoughts upon this psalm, if you like, a meditation uh, upon this psalm. It's always been one of my favorites ever since when I was first saved. A dear old sister said to me, if ever you're in trouble, always read the 37th psalm. She gave me a number of psalms, one for joy, uh, one for when we were prospering, one for some other time, and this was one whenever you're in trouble. I don't know whether it's um, a bit gloomy, but I seem to have been more in this psalm than the others uh, during my uh, life. And uh, it has always meant very much to me. And uh, so this morning I just wanted to um, just pass on a few very simple thoughts from this very, very wonderful psalm. We believe it was written at the end of David's life when he was an old man, Evidently, from what we can see from this psalm, it was written when he was still in a very big battle. We don't know what the battle was over. It may possibly have been to do with Absalom, his son. But whatever it was, he was still in an atmosphere of conflict and difficulty. There were many very big problems that were confronting him. And you will notice straight away that the way the psalm begins... Um, reveals that. Fret not thyself, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against them that work unrighteousness, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Now there's such a lot through this psalm uh, along that line. But I believe the key to the psalm you will find in verse 9. The last part, well, you can read, we'll read the whole verse. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait for the Lord, they shall inherit the land. Evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait for the Lord, they shall inherit the land. You see, this psalm is to do with inheriting. It is to do not only with seeing, as Ron said earlier, the dimensions of the land, but it is to do with actual, practical inheriting of what is ours. God, under the old covenant, gave a land to his people. And he made quite clear what were the dimensions, what were the borders of that land. He told them that he had covenanted with them to give it to them. There was no question about it. The almighty and omnipotent and sovereign God had given to them a land. Of course, at the time he gave it, the land was peopled with a number of very warlike and strong tribes. But that made no difference from heaven's point of view. God, in his sovereignty, had predestined and predetermined that that land should come to his people. Now, there was only one thing they had to do. They had to inherit it. 
And we know from the book of Joshua the tremendous battle over the inheriting of the land. It was a long, drawn-out battle. Now, if you get a bird's-eye picture of what happened over the land, it, it immediately becomes most instructive and helpful. It all began with Abraham when God appeared to him in Ur of the Chaldees and, and revealed his glory to him and then told him to get out to a land that I will show thee. And you know the battle that raged from that moment over Abraham's going out. He went out, but he wasn't obedient. So there was a stoppage until first Terah, his father, had died. Then he went on, but still disobedient until finally there was great trouble and he was cleared of his nephew Lot. And then finally he gets into the land, but the battle goes on. He's not in the land long before an evil heart of unbelief takes him down into Egypt. Famine comes to the land that God has promised him. And Abraham, instead of trusting in the Lord, because he was in the center of God's will, now mark it, he was in the center of God's will, instead of trusting the Lord to provide for him, he went out. And this psalm's got something to say about that. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. You see? You see, if you're in the center of God's will, there may be a famine. The famine may be permitted by God and created by Satan. And its whole objective is to get you out of the will of God, to get you compromised, to get you running to other things. And then you're out. Well, there's a battle. You know what happened? Abraham got himself into a terrible mess in the land of Egypt, and only by the grace of God did he get out of it unscathed. And then a little later, you know, the battle goes on backwards and forwards over Abraham in the land. And later on, the people go back down into Egypt, this time in the will of God. But you know the battle there was to get them back into the land. The tremendous battle, ten plagues in which a tremendous battle raged to get that people out of Egypt. How one moment Pharaoh said they can go, then the next minute, no, they can't, until finally the Lord, in a most notable victory, got them out. And then you know the story of how they journeyed across the wilderness and how it would seem as if Satan again was using every means possible to, to stop that people from getting into the land. Now, not from without, but from within. Always the same. All the enemy's tactics. Until finally they come to the edge of Jordan and when they should have gone over, you remember they got the, they got the, uh, the account of the twelve spies. Ten, was, uh, ten of them gave a very gloomy account and only two of them, uh, an account which was uh, breathing trust in the Lord. The people turned back of the forty years they wandered in the wilderness, till finally they went over with Joshua into the land and processed it. But even <clears throat> when they went over with Joshua into the land to process it, when the enemy could no longer hold out, uh, he tried to keep them in Egypt. When he couldn't keep them in Egypt, he tried to keep them in the wilderness. When he couldn't keep them in the wilderness, he fell back all the time. This, and he fell back to Jerusalem, you remember, and he kept Jerusalem in his grip for hundreds of years until King David, uh, the writer of this psalm, uh, appeared and through faith and trust in God finally took the last portion of the land that was destined to be the home of God's dwelling place. Now, you see, that's a great battle. And we are, it is not wrong for us to take this picture of the land as a symbol of, of the fullness of Christ. For it is. It is not just a picture of heaven. It may have much to say to us about heaven, but it, its supreme uh, lesson is that we have been given a land flowing with milk and honey in the Lord Jesus. We have been given a life in Christ in which every resource is found, it doesn't, in which God has made provision for everything that we might face. It's all there. Now, uh, the enemy may bring many difficulties in that land, in, when we're in the land, because his whole objective, if he can't stop us from possessing, at least it in, in part, 
His whole objective is to stop us from a full inheritance of the land. So you will see that this psalm is all to do with inheriting the land. It's so interesting because you might say, but hasn't David inherited the land? Here he is an old man. All his enemies have been now um, destroyed. Never before has Israel been in such a, a position of strength amongst the nations. But you see, David is, it has got a lot to say to us in this psalm about inheriting the land. For instance, we've read that verse 9, they that wait for the Lord, they that wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. No presumptuous, presumption, no haste, no premature working. Then verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the land and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So it's not naturally strong people naturally characterful people who are going to possess this land of Christ. It is those that are broken. So at the beginning, we've got to learn the lesson to wait for the Lord. And the second lesson we've got to learn is that we've got to be broken at the very beginning so that we become meek people if we're going to inherit the land. Now there's a lot more in verse 34. You see, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt thee to inherit the land. There is very much in this psalm about inheriting the land. But I believe it is all summed up in the, in the introductory verses to it. And it is those that I want to leave with you this morning. There are four key words that we have got to note if we are going to inherit Christ, not only personally, but corporately. If we are going to not only explore the Lord, but experience the Lord. If we are not only going to know up here that all the resources are there, but actually exploit the resources, if we are not only going to know here that God has made all provision for us in the Lord, but we're actually going to be in possession of the provision. You see, we've got, a, we've got a marvelous scriptures. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Where? In Christ Jesus. Then it says at the beginning of Ephesians, that tremendous letter about being in Christ and all the desires in Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. You see, it's all ours. But I mean, look at us all. How many of us in this room know anything of resources like that? It's all up here. It's theory. Well, we may have a partial experience. You see? But why are we not all living in the good of Christ? Why don't we know this life abundant? Listen to what the Lord Jesus said, I am come that they may have life. Well, we've all got life in this room as far as I know. We're all spiritually born of God. We've got life. I am come that they may have life. But what did he say? And that they may have it more abundantly. Now, that's what we haven't got, a lot of us. We've got life, but not abundance of life. How few people there are that come into the gatherings who've got certain, not only a little life from the Lord for themselves, but an abundance to give to others. Most people drag themselves in to fasten on one or two who have got something to give so that they may be helped to go a little farther. But that's not the point. God, God's, the, God's normal standard is not life. It is abundant life. Abundant life is not what the Lord means to be unique and singular. It's supposed to be the normal standard for us all. The abnormal Christian life is someone who's only got life. Jesus said, I am come that they may have life. I might have it more abundantly. There are so many other scriptures. You know these things that if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. How many Christians? How many Christians are truly free? Isn't it a fact that many Christians are in bondage? Bondage to self-life? Bondage to temperament? Bondage to circumstances? Bondage to the fear of man? Bondage to the fear of death? Bondage to all kinds of things? And yet Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. 
And he goes on to say, if the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And Paul, writing to the Galatians, says, stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ has made us, made you free. But how many Christians are free? Why, well, take a prayer meeting. You can hear a certain number who really got through and they pray, but there are many who remain always silent. Why? Through some form of bondage or other. So here we are, we have a land that is given to us, a land that truly is flowing with spiritual milk and honey, a land that has spiritual resources of every kind and nature, a land in which God has made all provision for the life of us, his people. We've got everything in Christ. Not just enough to get through with, but blessings, every spiritual blessing. It's all ours, but we're not enjoying it. It's not ours. And it's rather like some, if you came with me in imagination to in the days of Joshua, and we found a few Christians living in some little <coughs> hovels in the, in the wilderness side of the Jordan, and, and the rest have all gone over, and we were say to them, oh, well, what are you doing here? Well, well, we just can't do anything about it. Oh, we say, oh, do you know the Lord? Oh, yes, we know the Lord. We've seen the pillar of, of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We've seen the tabernacle. We've seen the glory of the Lord fill the place. Oh, yes, we know the Lord. But then what are you doing here? In this desert land? Well, uh, it, it's just too difficult for us. Do you believe the land is? Oh, of course we believe the land is ours. Well, why don't you see? Most of us Christians are just like that. We're living in little dilapidated hovels. <laughs> we are. There was a lady across this garden that one old brother in the company always told me he felt was a sign in this place. That's why the Lord kept her there for so long. She had a lot of money and she lived in an absolutely dilapidated hovel. Green mold grew down the walls. She slept in a, in, in a pile of, of stinking sand in the corner and she had thousands of pounds and that's like most Christians yeah. we literally are living in dilapidated hovels that cannot keep out the weather in which there is no heating or warmth in which we're living on a bare minimum of necessities and we call it the Christian life and then we say we can't understand why other people don't get saved I should think not I, they they are doing pretty well uh, in life compared with some of us. If a non-Christian looks at us and sees only too clearly the kind of spiritual experience that is ours, that is only just above water all the time, can we expect that they want it? Of course not. But that is not what we should be having. We should be inheriting the land. How do you inherit them? And someone says, well, I'm so weak. You see, that's not the point. You see, Johnny read to us this morning, it is the very, the, those are the very people God has chosen, the weak and the, and the base and the things that are despised and the things which are not. Well, there's no one who's not. But God has chosen things that are not. Confound things that are. Well, if that can't comfort anyone, you see, we've all, we're so full of excuses. It's no good we say, it's all right for brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. They can do it, but not me. And there are many people in this very room this morning who I've often heard say to me, uh, well, I don't believe the Lord would ever speak to me. Isn't it amazing? My sheep hear my voice. But evidently they're so peculiar that uh, they're a particular brand of the Lord's sheep that just don't hear his voice. Isn't it amazing? You see? The devil gets us, no sooner are you and we, no sooner are we saved than the devil's out immediately to rob us of what is ours. And to, to give us a true salvation, yes, he can't touch our salvation, but to rob us of the enjoyment and the experience of its fullness and its greatness. And what does he leave the multitude of Christians with? Just a few doctrines. Thank God, still saved through faith in Christ. But all they've got is the doctrine. They haven't got the experience. 
And then we wonder why people don't come to the Lord. Of course. It's obvious. Because, you see, the world is not influenced by doctrine, by what we believe. They are influenced by what we possess. Always. Always. Every person I've ever known who's come to the Lord has not been influenced by what a person believes first. They've been influenced by what that person possesses. They always say the same thing. That person has, some, has something I haven't got. Then they start to inquire, what is it you believe? Because somehow or other, what you possess is connected with what you believe. But it's that way around, you see. Do you understand what I'm getting at? And so you see, this Psalm 37 is really tremendous. Inheriting the land. Well, it's no good saying, I'm no good. I'm weak. I'm not a spiritual aristocrat. If I was, of course, we might get somewhere. And uh, if only I was spiritually mighty, we'd be able to do something. No, that's not the point. Do you know the Lord said there is only one thing the children of Israel required? Now, this is very interesting. Only one thing that they actually required physically. Physically. Do you know what it was? The soles of their feet. That's the only thing they needed. Nothing else. They didn't need to be strong men like weightlifters or anything else. Mighty men armed to the teeth with all kinds of weapons. They didn't have to have, even have a knowledge of the art uh, of, of warfare or anything like that. No, not at all. All the children of Israel had to have was the soles of their feet and they had to use them, that's all. Wherever the soles of your feet tread, that will I give you. So physically they needed the soles of their feet and spiritually they needed faith. And believe me, if you're weak and base and unable, you need faith to use the soles of your feet. If you've got a bit of strength and, and a sort of good experience of warfare and a few other things, you might think, well, I, praise the Lord, I've got the soles of my feet, but I've got a few other things as well. We, we ought to be able to get through on this battle. But you see, there were times when God's children failed in the land because it says there there were iron chariots. They'd never come up against iron chariots before. See, so when it was a question of, of, the, of the art of warfare, God's people failed. Because they were trying to match strength with strength, might with might, power with power. All they had to do was match all, all the enemy's devices with faith and the soles of their feet. Now that's exactly what happened with Jericho. So it's no good trying to think that we're talking about a fairy tale or I'm trying to read into Joshua what's not there. All they, the way they won the, the, the city of Jericho was with the soles of their feet. They went round six times once a day and seven times on the seventh day. Their soles of their feet, that's all. Can you just imagine what the people must have thought as they looked from the walls at them all, going round and round and round? What were they doing? They didn't seem to have much strength. They didn't seem to have uh, uh, very great uh, weapons and so on. But they were using what God had given them. The one thing he required, the soles of their feet. In faith. Well, um, you see, here there is a land for you and I to possess, and God has equipped every one of us, spiritually. It's no good you saying you're weak. It's no good you saying you haven't got the character. I've often heard that one, uh, that others have got. And those with more character will always go further. No, it's not so. God has equipped every one of his blood-bought children with what is needed to possess the land. Spiritual feet, as it were, just to put down upon what is yours. As in Ephesians, why does Paul speak of that amazing battle? He says, don't go forward, don't go backwards, just stand and you'll win. That's all. <coughs> Having done all, he says, stand. That's all. That would, it's the same thing, using the soles of your feet, putting them down and saying, this is God's, by his word. Now, you see, um, if you and I were to believe, have a spirit of faith like that, it would change things entirely. In this Psalm 37, you have these four words which sum up the character that God looks for if you and I are going to possess Christ. Look at the four words. Verse 3, trust. Verse 4, delight. Verse 5, commit. And verse 7, rest. 
four words which sum up the, the way into a possession of the land, sum up the key, as it were, to inheriting what is ours in Christ. Trust in the Lord, delight thyself also in the Lord, commit thy way unto the Lord, rest in the Lord. Now, isn't that interesting? Trust in the Lord and do good. Don't just be passive. Don't just be a passenger. Don't just be a spectator. Don't make faith an argument for sleeping. Some people's idea of faith is that you just say, oh, the Lord will do it, the Lord will do it, and they don't do anything. Trust in the Lord and do good. That's why we've got this book of Haggai with us just at present. Be strong and work, says the Lord, for I am with you. Don't let there be any of this kind of thing. It's not the Lord's time. It's not the Lord's time. When it's in actual fact an excuse for us all to have a nice little sleep and a nice bit of spiritual lethargy. No. Um, Psalm 37 gives us the key to inheriting the land. Trust in the Lord and do good. We had never a holiday from doing good. I'm sorry. But we never can have a holiday from doing good. Trust in the Lord and do good. What will happen? So shalt thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt feed on his faithfulness. Now isn't that wonderful? Are you experiencing the faithfulness of the Lord? Well if you're not, it's because you're not trusting in the Lord and doing good. Because God's word never fails. If you are in the land and trusting in the Lord and doing good, you'll not only dwell in it, but you'll feed on his faithfulness. It doesn't matter however many famines come, however many natural disasters, as it were, overtake the land. God will provide. He has ravens that can bring you food, as he did with Elijah. He has those, those barrels of meal which are empty, but which always yield something more. He has those cruises of oil that never run dry. You see, where there is a trusting in the Lord, God's resources come and you feed on his faithfulness. But once you start saying, no good, oh dear, 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 what's happened? There you are, you see. Lance is always wrong. I've trusted in the Lord and now look at the mess I'm in. Wouldn't have had a burst pipe and we wouldn't have had this and, and children wouldn't be in bed and the place wouldn't be upside down. Wouldn't have had a power cut, I suppose. If we look at the world, they get on very well. Well, that kind of spirit is a, a spirit that breeds unhappiness and discontent, not only in you, but in others, and it cuts you off from feeding on the Lord's faithfulness. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land. Now, what would you have thought when that woman came to that um, barrel of meal and she looked in? I know what most of you would have said. You'd have said, oh, nothing in there. Can't live on that. There's a famine in the land, there's nothing else. I've got children and others. I can't possibly live on that. How ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But you see, that woman never said that. She listened to the word of God through, through God's prophet, and she just went to the... She didn't, I don't think she investigated very much, just put her arm in every day, and out came a cup full or two uh, of meal. Enough to feed them. What would you have said if, the, if a prophet of the Lord had said to you, um, I'm hungry, I want that food? And you knew that it was the last meal that you and your little son, who'd be had a miraculous birth, was going to have. Would you have given it to the prophet? You know what the woman said? She said, oh, I shall die. I'm going to die. With, this is the last meal. I'm just going to cook it and bake these things for myself and my son, and then we're, we're going to die. Do you see? She gave it to the prophet of the Lord. She preferred to keep him alive than her own kith and kin. That's tremendous, you know. For it was one thing for the woman to sacrifice her, but to sacrifice her own son, her only son, was tremendous. But you see, it never failed. You see, if you trust in the Lord and do good, in other words, put God first. Give God the honour. Put first things first. Then you'll dwell in the land and feed on his faith. There's an experience for those folk like that, that that you don't have anywhere else. Well, it's there. 
Of course, it may be very difficult. It may be that the heavens are not giving the, the rain and so on, spiritual air, all very bad. But if you are trusting in the Lord, then you'll find the faithfulness of the Lord will be your food. You'll find it. And then again, it says, Delight thyself also in the Lord shall give thee the desires of thine heart. There is no more remarkable promise in the whole of the Bible. I've never failed to be amazed over this one sentence in Scripture. Listen. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee what? His desires? No. He shall give thee the <laughs> desires of thine heart. Do you know this is true? Some people say to me, well, I've got desires of my heart. I've never been given. Of course you've not been given. You've not delighted yourself also in the Lord. I know there are some people who, who exert themselves to come down on a Sunday morning and eke out a little word of praise. And then they feel now, so then the Lord should open the heavens and come out in full splendor to meet me. I've, I've delighted myself in him. What nonsense. What absolute nonsense. Delight thyself also in the Lord is a condition of heart which lives in conscious communion with the Lord all the time. And those people do get given the desires of their hearts. You've got them in Scripture. Hannah, how she loved the Lord. That great song of worship that came out of her wasn't just the, the thought of a moment. It was the product of a lifetime. She, she lived in conscious communion with the Lord. But she didn't get what she wanted and how she wept and mourned and moaned before the Lord, though she delighted in him. When the Lord gave her what she wanted, she gave him back. But what did the Lord do? He gave her, if I remember rightly, seven sons and daughters after that. She got the desires of our heart sevenfold in the end. But the one that she was given, she gave back wholly to the Lord. She let him go back into the house of God, never to actually be near him again from day to day. But God gave her the desires of her heart. Delight thyself also in the Lord. You see, worship is a key to so much. It's not just a little subsidiary. It's not just a little part of our gatherings. Worship is the key to inheriting the fullness of Christ. No non-worshipping Christian will ever know Christ in fullness. God is a God of love. He requires love. He longs for love. He seeks for love. That's his whole quest. He doesn't want people who can spout just doctrine, who can somehow or other like a walking religious encyclopedia. God wants people who love him. And it is true that those that love the Lord, the, the Lord's secret is with them. And they are given the desires of their heart. I think this is a most marvellous scripture. Why, uh, it, it is, in fact, the, the most remarkable sentence in God's word because it's unqualified except for this. Delight thyself also, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Oh, that it, you, could, you and I could see that. To fling ourselves to the, before the Lord and long to love him as he ought to be loved. We shall have the desires of our heart in the end. If not even now, it will be in the finish when we're in the presence of the Lord. Well, then it also says, commit thy, uh, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. If we're going to inherit the land, we've got to commit our way unto the Lord. How many of us, this is the problem, we don't really want to commit our way unto the Lord. We have certain ways that are private paths, and there is a little notice up for the Lord and all of sundry, no thoroughfare. Private road. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and he shall bring it to pass. Another way of putting this is roll thy burden upon the Lord. Have you got a big burden? Well, if you're facing inheriting the land, you'll have burdens. The enemy will see to that. And the way through is to roll thy burden upon the Lord. Roll it off yourself and onto him. You see, I remember once listening to the principal, I think it was, of um, Redcliffe Missionary College. And I remember one thing she said. She was speaking about casting all thy care upon him, for he careth for you. And she pointed out to us that the word cast was a most remarkable word. It meant hurl. Hurl your care upon the Lord. 
because he careth for you. What a word. You see, the Lord uh, is trying to underline something. You don't have anything to do with your care. Don't have anything to do with your burden. If you've got a big burden, roll it on the Lord. Commit it to the Lord. Get rid of it. Oh dear, when I see some of the lines of worry appearing upon once young faces in the company, I wonder how, few, how many of us have really learnt the lesson of rolling their burden upon the Lord, hurling their care upon him. You see, of course it's all very well to talk theologically, but you see, there is, look at the weather we've got. There are many, we have many anxieties and worries about homes and children and property and much else. But if only we could learn to roll these things upon the Lord. The point is this. Do they belong to the Lord? Well, of course, if they don't belong to the Lord, you'd better carry on worrying. That's all. If they don't belong to the Lord, carry on worrying. They're your responsibility, not his. I remember when I was in Scandinavia a little while ago, one or two people came up to me afterwards and said, you know, this thing about provision, we've never known about provision. The lady said to me, I, I'm always asking the Lord about my house. He doesn't provide anything at all. And I just said to her, is your house the Lord's? With that she walked off. It wasn't. That's the point. She chose who came to her house and a few other things. So I just said to her, you carry on bearing your burden. Your house is your house and it's your burden. But if we give everything over to the Lord, car, house, home, family, business, everything else, it's his burden. We can roll it upon him. He'll take responsibility for it. It belongs to him. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Everything. Take your body. Take your body. To whom does your body belong? If it belongs to the Lord, here comes some sickness and illness. We can take it from the Lord. He'll either deal with it or he'll teach us through it. But if our body is our own and lent to the Lord at various times, well, there's We've got a responsibility there. See, we, we like the Lord to be a kind of char. Come in and do the dirty work. Wipe up the floors. Do what we don't want to do. Make life a little m bit more easy, a little easier, and a little more uh, a sort of uh, uh, joyful. You see, but we don't want the Lord to be in charge. So whenever we're in a trouble, we get on a kind of spiritual phone and say, Lord, come immediately, come immediately. We've got to do something. Please come. And we sometimes wonder why we suffer. Because, of course, the Lord's, the Lord's not going to be treated like that. He's not going to allow himself to be cheapened. He's love, that's true. He will always come. But he's not going to allow himself just to be made into a drug. Not for our good. So commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass, and will make thy righteousness to go forth as the light, and thy justice as the noonday. And then, of course, rest in the Lord, and fret not thyself. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Well, rest in the Lord. Isn't that a strange way of inheriting the land? Resting in the Lord, you see. And it's interesting that the word here has got the idea of silence in it. Be silent to the Lord. Oh, you poured out your heart. Now then, just be quiet. Rest. Now, I think this is very wonderful because, you see, it is the, many of us have got an, an idea about inheriting the land that is anything but rest. It's all strain, all tension of the wrong kind. Yes, there's a, there's a conflict, but the way to inherit the land is to rest in the Lord and to wait for him. And there could be nothing that you and I need more at this time than to learn that we must do our duty. We must trust in the Lord. We must delight in him. We must commit our way to the And when we've done those duties, we can rest. But there's no rest if we have him. Rest is connected with trusting in the Lord, with worship, delighting ourselves in the Lord, and with committing our way wholly and always unto him. Then there comes a rest, the peace of God which passes all understanding, garrisons our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May the Lord help us all 
really to possess a little more of what is ours in Christ by this way. May you dwell in the land and feed on the faithfulness of the Lord. May you know the deep, deep love of Jesus. 